G'day everyone, welcome to Lubrication Explained. In today's video we're going to talk, be, be talking about TAN, so we'll talk about acid types, we'll talk about organic acid formation, and we'll talk about mineral acid formation in lubricants and engine oils. So acids can broadly be broken up into two different groups. You've got organic acids and mineral acids. And among the mineral acids, you've got both strong and weak acids. Now, in the lubricants world, we can think of these as coming from effectively two different places. So organic acids are byproducts of the oxidation process of base oils, and strong and weak mineral acids come from contaminants. So that's kind of the framework that we want to be thinking about when we think about acids in lubricants. These are obviously related to the used oil analysis measurements of TAN, SAN, and AN, which is total acid number, strong acid number, and acid number. Now, organic acids um, form as a byproduct of the oxidation process in base oils and additives. So if you remember, we talked about oxidation as being effectively like the cooking of oil. And if you haven't checked out the oxidation video, I recommend that you go and watch that first. Um, but what we did say is that, um, okay, from high, high school chemistry, oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is gain of electrons. But in the oxidation of base oils, we can simplify that down to oxidation is gain of oxygen and reduction is loss of oxygen. And we use the example of the combustion of methane. And as it oxidizes, the actual process is methane combining with oxygen to make carbon dioxide and water. But that's a fast oxidation cycle, right? So um, when combustion occurs, it goes straight from methane to carbon dioxide. With oxidation, which is a, a slower process, we tend to have intermediate molecules that are formed. And so we gave the example of methane. When it first oxidizes, you add an oxygen, you get methanol. Now, what's interesting here is that methanol is in itself a weak organic acid. So we can already see that the oxidation process has produced organic acids. Okay. If you oxidize it again, you get formaldehyde. And oxidizing it again, you get formic acid. Now, formic acid is interesting because if you look at this uh, functional group, COOH, right, that is what we call a carboxyl group. So formic acid is the simplest of all the carboxylic acids. And if I were to change that left-hand hydrogen, right, the, the hydrogen that's on the left of the screen, that could be any number of molecules, right? We could have polymers, we could have esters, we could have naphthalene, naphthalenes or anything. Um, so there are an infinite combinations of of different types of carboxylic acids that can be formed. Now, what does that look like when it comes to the auto-oxidation cycle that we talked about in the oxidation video? Well, as you can see there, in the very middle of the cycle is that carboxyl group. So as we oxidize base oils, and we, as we oxidize base oil components, we are continuously forming carboxylic organic acids. And this is how the acidity of uh, of an oil is related to its oxidation. So often we can think of the two as going hand in hand. So if we looked at the monograph and you graphed tan and oxidation, there should effectively be a linear relationship between the two. So as oxidation goes up, the tan value also goes up. So in what circumstance would these two not be linearly correlated, right? So maybe we have some kind of curve so that for, you know, as oil ages and, and oxidizes, tan increases above that uh, which is produced by organic acids. And the reality is that we also have another kind of acid formation, which is the mineral acids, and that is contamination of the lubricant. So a little bit of uh, a recap on high school chemistry again. Okay, Within the mineral acids, let, let's talk first about the strong acids, of which there are seven hydrochloric, nitric, sulfuric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic, uh, perchloric, and chloric acids, right? Now, when I use the term strong acid, I'm using this in a chemical sense, which means to say that these fully dissociate in water. So if I poured um, hydrochloride uh, into um, you know, a bottle of water, the hydrogen atoms and the chlorine atoms would fully separate into the water, right? And they, so they kind of fully go into solution. That's the definition of a strong acid. With weak acids, that doesn't happen, right? So some 
if if hydrochloric acid were a weak acid, then some of the hydrogen and chlorine would continue to stay bonded, even though it's in solution. Now in lubricants, where do these strong acids come from? Hydrochloric acid can come from the breakdown of refrigerations. Um, nitric acid you'll see as a byproduct of nitration, right, which is a can be a problem in you know gas engines. Sulfuric acid is probably the most common one. So uh, diesel contains usually a small amount of sulfur. Um, you might have contamination of natural gas with H2S. And we also get uh, a breakdown of EP additives, which usually contain sulfur in them. So ZDDP is a classic example, right? That has sulfur in it. Um, but also a lot of the industrial lubricants, um, even when they're ashless, still contain uh, sulfur in them. Uh, not only that, but the base oils also contain sulfur. So mineral base oils, particularly the group ones, have some sulfur in them. Uh, and then you've got perchloric and chloric acid, which can also be the breakdown of refrigerants. So let's look at a specific example. Let's look at sulfuric acid and say, okay, how does that ever end up in my lubricant, right? So and I'm gonna give the example of a, of a landfill gas. So I want you to meet my friend, uh, let's call him uh, Gian. He's holding a piece of plasterboard, right? Maybe he's built a house and he's got some excess plasterboard. Maybe he's demolishing a house, right? Okay, so he takes that plasterboard and he puts it in the landfill. Um, not great, we'd like to recycle it, but whatever, it is what it is. Okay, he's gonna wash his hands of the job and he's gonna go away. Well, that plasterboard, it's gonna end up mixed in with a whole bunch of other general rubbish. Um, I've got a battery in here. Hopefully people aren't throwing batteries in the landfill. But eventually it's going to get pushed off and it will make its way into a landfill where it's going to mix in with all that other trash. Now let's just consider the plasterboard for a moment. Right? Now that plasterboard contains a whole lot of gypsum and gypsum is mostly calcium sulfate. Right? So again, there's an S in that, in that uh, chemical equation. So the S is of course sulfur. Now, uh, the gypsum in a, in a landfill, because it's, it's going to get buried quite deep in the landfill, the landfill is in what we call an anaerobic environment. So there's no oxygen down there. And it's going to, rather than going through an oxidation process, it's going to get eaten by bacteria um, that turn the, the sulfate um, into H2S, right? So the bacteria are going to slowly eat it away and that will form H2S gas. Now in landfills, we take that gas and we generally put it through a stationary gas engine and we produce power. So the gas, the waste gas is going to have some H2S contamination, sometimes as much as you know, 1,500, 2,000 parts per million. If we don't scrub that gas, what effectively is gonna happen is H2S will combine with water to make sulfuric acid. Now, there are some intermediate steps, just like with the combustion of methane. So what actually happens is H2S combines with oxygen in the combustion chamber and it makes water and sulfur dioxide. That sulfur dioxide can further oxidize to become sulfur trioxide and sulfur trioxide confines with water to make H2SO4, which is the strong sulfuric acid. How does that happen um, in the actual fact is we have H2S and water making sulfuric acid. Now, the only way that we can really reduce the amount of sulfuric acid that ends up in our crankcase is to either reduce the amount of water or reduce the amount of sulfuric acid, right? Because we can't control the amount of oxygen. So, uh, because oxygen is necessary for combustion of the gas. So, we can do a couple of things in the landfill. We can scrub our waste gas stream, right? So we can try and reduce the amount of H2S or we could try to reduce the amount of water in the crankcase. So there is often a recommendation that, that people increase their, their jacket water temperatures to try and boil off some of that water that might be in the engine oil in the crankcase. All right, so in practice, how does that um, H2S make its way into the crankcase? Well, if you can imagine um, you know, the very uh, top landing of the piston, right? we get combustion above it. And so the gases are gonna wanna try and get past the compression and oil rings. And that that's never a perfect seal, uh, particularly if you have liner scoring or something like that. Um, and so some amount of gas that's been combusted is gonna make its way into the crankcase where it will form strong acids. 
what we don't like about strong acids is of course they dissociate they raise the corrosive potential of the oil and that can be damaging to to bearings particularly when they're made of copper all right so we talked about all the strong acids and where that it can come from but remember there are also weak acids and weak acids i mean there's there's thousands of these but three of the crucial ones boric acid hydrofluoric acid and phosphoric acid so boric acid is itself sometimes um an additive right it's it's an anti-wear additive but there are a whole bunch of you know um borated esters and other boron based additives that can break down and form boric acid hydrofluoric acid is a really interesting one because this is an example of where um, we have to be very careful about talking about strong and weak right so hydrofluoric acid is technically a weak acid in the chemical sense because it doesn't fully dissociate in water however it is basically the most corrosive acid on earth right you get this stuff on your hands and it will it will melt your hands so um, hydrofluoric acid very very corrosive but technically a weak acid and hydrofluoric acid can be produced um, through the breakdown of freon refrigerants so um, obviously in refrigeration applications that can be a problem and finally you've got phosphoric acid which can be produced when phosphate esters break down all right so what we've talked about now is organic acids strong mineral acids and weak mineral acids and again to go back to the beginning of this discussion think about them as being uh, as coming from two separate areas uh, organic acids are formed by oxidation strong and weak acids come as a result of contamination right so i hope that gives you a a, a good framework for thinking about acids uh, in lubricants obviously we haven't dealt into uh, how tan is measured in the lab that's something that we'll get into in a, uh, a future video as usual if you've got questions or comments please leave them down below otherwise this has been lubrication explained